When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but His smile quickly drives it away. sign or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor He shows and the joy He bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do. Where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Amen. 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 Hey, cut him open, 323. I'm preaching from the hymn book today done this once before. 325, trust and obey. <clears throat> Sometimes these blessed hymns, I mean, they just resonate and ring out with, with doctrine and with, with good messages and with, with strong biblical uh, precedents. Sometimes the very words of God are within them. Sometimes it's just a, a principle or a cry of a heart, right? Just somebody that, that penned down how they were feeling or what they were feeling, what they were experiencing. And this is another one that just it was, was playing over in my mind and, and as I was, was studying this morning and, and trying to figure out what I was going to preach about uh, in, in, in the, the remaining hours, I guess, of last night uh, after all that was going on was just uh, trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey. This is this is kind of the, the cadence and the walk of the Christian life. You're just continually trusting and obeying and, and trusting and obeying. And, and every time you obey, you're actually implementing your faith and your trust. And you're, and you're trusting every time you take that step of obedience that, that he would bless you and, and strengthen you in it. So it's it's just this reciprocal walk and this reciprocal cadence of, of, of my life. And I, I wish it were so and, and more and more every day. That verse 1, it starts off and he says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. And, 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 and the Bible records way back in Genesis 3 and verse 8. You can go there if you want, Genesis 3 and verse 8. You're going to be a little bit, a little bit scattered here, but 
Genesis 3, verse 8, it talks about walking with the Lord. Walking with the Lord. Way back in the Garden of Eden, that was that was where men were. That was where men men were were supposed to be, anyways, was walking with the Lord. We know the Bible records of Enoch that he walked with God, and eventually he was not, the Bible said. I believe that he had this walk with God, and, and it was close, and it was proper, and it was right, and eventually the Lord took him, the Bible says. Here in the early days of the creation, in verse 8 of Genesis 3, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So we see here that the expected place that Adam and Eve were to be in was in the presence of God. And yet, when God came walking, they got they got out of the way. They they got out of the out of sight, out of out of mind best they could, because at this time they had sinned and they were ashamed of their sin. But we see in this picture the the, the reaction and the, and the relationship actually that was supposed to take place was that God would come walking in the cool of the day and His presence was what men was to be in. The Bible says says uh, they were they were before comfortable here, but now they were naked and therefore they could not walk as times before. As, as it was before, so sweet to spend that time with the Lord. Now it was something of great discomfort. It's interesting how it's, versed, how it's worded here. It says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking. So here is the voice that's walking. We, we think of a voice and it's just, it's just shooting through the, the waves. We don't think of a voice as walking. We, we think of a voice as sounding out. And yet here the word is walking. Well, this is, this is Jesus, of course, right? This is his, his person, his, the, the express image of the Father here walking with Adam and Eve. Or rather, that's what he intended at that time. This is supposed to be a time of, of sweet fellowship, this walking with the Lord in the light of His Word. In the presence of the voice of the Lord, we're to walk and we're to bask and we're to rejoice in that. You can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5, if you would, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5. As you're turning there, let me read for you Psalm 119, verse 105. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's exactly what the word is intended to be for us. And that's what the song leader, the song here singer is capturing when he says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, it's to be that lamp, it's to be that light unto our feet to give us direction, to give us guidance, to allow us to see what's before us. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, and in verse 31, the Bible says, but as for thee, stand out here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess. So here there's commandments, there's statutes, there's judgments. There's the word of God being given unto Moses that he would teach it unto others. Verse 32 says, Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left, okay? So he's saying you shall observe to do as was commanded in those statutes, the judgments, the laws, the word that was given. You're not to go to the left hand. You're not to go to the right hand. But what are you to do? Verse 33, you shall walk, okay? Not left, not right. Walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you that ye may live and that ye may, it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. The promise is a possession of the land if they what? Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right, but walk in the ways of God. And what are the ways of the God? The law, the statutes, the light of his word was what was to guide them. They were to walk clearly and steadfastly and straight ahead in the light of the word of God as it went before them. These commands, these statutes were to be walked in and they would give them long life. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful? Everybody would love to have long life. Well, here it's made clearly that the, the promise is made that sustain, sustainment, you be sustained if you walk in the Lord in the light of his word. And the song continues, what a glory he sheds 
on our way. I'm reminded of another song. It is glory just to walk with him whose blood has ransomed me. It is rapture for my soul each day. It is joy divine to feel him near when skies above are drear. Bless the Lord, it's glory all the way. And, and these, these two go inside. I mean, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. He gives glory. He gives victory. He gives, he, gives, he gives himself in that. And it continues, and it says, While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. We do his good will. We do his good will. Well, what is the will of God? People often ask. What is the will of God? And it's listed, actually, many times. It's not obscure. It's not like people think sometimes, like, oh, I'm just searching for the will of God, and they're just walking around hoping to just trip and fall on her, or maybe get a call, and the Lord will say, you know, you know Brother Shane, this is my will for your life. No, no, it's, 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 not, so, it's not so spooky. That's not, not, that's not how the will of God is. He, he says it many times in scriptures, and you can go look this up. Put in uh, any, any, any Bible search software, the will of, and you're just going to find the will of the Lord, the will of God, and it's your sanctification. What's that? Walking in the Lord, walking in His Word, walking in His ways, walking in His statutes of judgment. That's sanctification. That's, that's doing things in a sanctified, set-apart, different manner. The will of God is your sanctification. The will of God is this. In everything, give thanks. We need to give thanks in all things. That means when it's hard, and when it's easy, when it's, when it's stressful, and when you're relaxed, when you're in pain, and when you feel wonderful. You're to give thanks in all things. That's a tough thing to do and be in the will of God in, is it not? How often do we grumble and murmur and complain and just, just mourn our days? Woe is me, woe is me. But the will of God for your life is in everything give thanks. That's in Thessalonians. The will of God is that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what's the will of God for the believer then? Because you've already jumped in on that will for him. His will is that you would be saved, and here you are today, born again. Wonderful. You've fulfilled the will of God in that area. Oh, but his will is that none should perish. That means that your neighbors, your co-workers, your family, the nation around you need to follow along with that will because that's the will of God for everyone is that none of them would perish. And the Bible actually records a special part in his heart is for the little ones. It, he's especially not willing that any of the little ones would perish. And so, so that gives great gravity to the fact that, that we need to do our best to reach the little children and not offend the little children, but rather to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to give them an opportunity to grow in the things of God, to allow them to come and to be with Christ. That is the will of God. The will of God also is that we would put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. By what? Having the word of God known, having it understood in our own hearts and be able to speak it. We need to be versed in the Bible. We need to know the Bible. We need to know the statutes and the judgments, just as Moses was charged here in Deuteronomy, to know the statutes and judgments so that he could what? Tell it to the people, right? He was able to put to silence the ignorance of foolish men by knowing the word of God. And that was the will of God. The will of God also is that you would suffer for well-doing. That doesn't sound very wonderful, but that's God's will for your life. God's will. Oh, what is God's will? Is it God's will that I have a million dollars? Is it his will that I have a big... No, it's his will that you suffer. <laughs> that doesn't sound great, but it's his will that you suffer for well-doing. In other words, you go and do good and suffer for it. Didn't your Lord Jesus Christ do the same? Aren't we to follow in his steps as he set forth that example? And the will of God is that ye believe, finally. That ye believe, that ye have faith, that each one of you has faith to believe in every aspect of our life, to, to, to trust God, to believe God, to, to seek him, to trust and obey. And when you do this, the, the psalm writer here, the psalm writer, he's right. When you do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's, that's the will of God for your life. Trust him, obey him, and he will be there with you. Verse 2, it says, not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies. 
but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. What a blessed verse that is. When it says, hey, when it's shadow, when there's darkness, when there's cloudiness, when there's gloominess, that's the, that's the time when we feel at our, at our weakest and our lowliest. Go to Psalm chapter 23. Psalm chapter 23. <clears throat> but it's at these times that God promises that his smile will quickly drive these things away. So the shadow, that can't rise against you. The cloud, it can't darken your skies when you're on the Lord's side, trusting him and obeying him. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that means that he means he is leading you. That means he's caring for you, but that also means that he's directing you. It says in verse 2, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Both of those are an indication of God making or, or, or forcing or leading you to do something. He's in charge here. But what he's in charge of isn't, isn't that he would be overlording you or, or bringing hurt to your life or making you to like just not have a great time. He's leading you to good things, greener pastures. He's leading you to still waters that you can rest your soul beside. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And here it is. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so when there's shadows, when there's darkness, when there's death in our lives, that's when God is there to comfort you with his rod, with his staff, with the implements that he uses to guide, to correct, to rebuke, to chase, and to lead you, that's when he brings you that great comfort and how he does it. God is there to take you through those dark, scary, shadowy times, and he does it happily. Verse 5 says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's a wonderful and blessed psalm, and it's a promise that you've got to take care of. Sometimes when we are in a shadow of death, the valley of the shadow of death, you can't think of anything much darker and scarier and loomier than that, but God here promises that he will be there to comfort us, therefore you should fear no evil. Don't fear any harm that can come to you. Don't fear any hurts that might come to you. Why? Because he is leading and he will even prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. You'll eat, you'll be comforted, you'll have fellowship with him even in that. Anointing your head with oil, giving you of that spirit to strengthen you, to, 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 to give you boldness, to, to help you through this thing. And goodness and mercy, wouldn't you want that to follow you all the days of your life? All of those things come from a father that is pleased with you. And when your father is pleased with you, it's because you are trusting and obeying with him. He will chase away all doubts. He will chase away all fears, all sighs, and all tears. That ends it there. And he will abide with you when you trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Verse 3. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Our burdens and our toils. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> Our burdens. How often are we burdened? Are we weighed down? Are we under the load? Are we under the yoke? There's not a burden that we bear or sorrow we share, but he will quickly drive it away. Matthew 11, verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. How can a yoke be easy? How, you know, 
you think you think of the, the beasts of burden like a big ox that has has that giant hunk of wood on its shoulders is it, is it pulling that yoke how can that be easy how can a burden be light how can how can you take a great big and heavy burden a backpack on you well how go to John chapter 4 John chapter 4 is because our toil he doth richly repay John chapter 4 John 4 and verse 34. Jesus saith unto him, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. So the burden, the sorrow, the toil is richly repaid. And this is, this is why it's easy and it's light. Man, the things that we go through on this life and in this world... We know they're, they're trying. We know it's a struggle. We know sometimes it gets very hard and challenging. But as the songwriter here says, it's because God intends to richly repay us for that. It's because in our hearts and our minds, ah, we know that we are working and toiling and suffering for greater things beyond, that the burdens and the sorrows don't seem so great. Jesus said, come unto me if you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and you learn of me. When you learn of things of the Most High, you start to understand His perspective of things. Uh, the, the little pains in our neck, the pains in our back, the pains in our limbs, the things that we go through, the, the, the exhaustion that we have, the sicknesses and illnesses that we have, are but minor sufferings for the glory that is before us. We have eternity to spend in perfection, in joy, in bliss, without tear, without sorrow, without suffering, without anguish, without sin. And that's to come one day. And, and so this is but a vapor and but a moment. And so, so this burden, this sorrow, this, this toil, when it's repaid, is going to be but nothing. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. We just need to believe on him, trust in him, and understand that what we have to come is much better. Also understand that the work is his. He says, come unto me, my labor, uh, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, because just like it says there in John 4 and verse 38, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And how often do we experience that when we go out and we get into the fields and we're working for the harvest? How often do we experience that when we get to a door, when we get into somebody's uh somebody's a uh, person in, 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 a, in a mall or in, in a park or something like that. We find them already prepared to receive the gospel. We're just harvesting. We're just reaping of that reward. And yet it was somebody else that did all of the work. It was somebody else that planted and watered. It was somebody else that, that went through the struggle and the trials. And, the, and most, most importantly and, and most often and most, most highlighted about all that is the fact that it was God that prepared their hearts so that that point would come where you would just simply reap it. Just like it was in the Old Testament when God was promising they would cross the river and go into the promised land, they were going to be in fields that were already ready to be harvested. There was going to be, there was going to be sheep and pastures ready for them. Why? Because they were just going to walk into a land that had built houses, that had, that had already everything prepared for them. Somebody else did the work. They were just simply receiving of the promised land. And how often do we reap when we did next to zero work? God did all the work. Somebody before us did much of the work. We get wages, we gather fruit unto life eternal and did no labor for it. And so if we got a little bit of a burden down here, if we have a little bit of a toiling down here, a little bit of sorrow down here, what is it for all of the things that God 
first and foremost, promises for us once we're in heaven and we're in glory. But secondly, for all the things that he just freely gives us in this life that we never struggle for, we never labor for, we just have simply given to us as a wonderful blessing, an extension of his mercies for us. And we get those mercies, and we reap more of those mercies when we trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Verse 4, it says, But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. I'm going to Psalms right now. The delights of his love, Psalm chapter 1, the delights of God's great love for us, we ought to delight in the Lord as much as he delights in us. I think it's one of these scenarios where it's a, it's a mutual give-take kind of love. The more we delight in the law of the Lord, the more he delights in us. Why? Because, because we're being conformed to the image of his son. The word's washing us. We're, we're delighting in the thing that God has offered us, and that's the Bible. This is how God's going to communicate with us. how he's going to grow us, how he's going to strengthen us, how he gives us power to overcome temptations. And so when we delight more in these types of things, then we experience the delight of his love coming back to us. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You see how delighting in the law and meditating in his law and rejoicing and, and being, being overwhelmed and, and just loving his law led to being like a tree planted by the rivers of water. God providing something plenteous and, and often and reciprocating and just giving blessing upon blessing as the waters are to the tree that, that is planted next to it. Leaf with life not withering, but rather bringing forth fruit season after season after season is what's promised for those that delight in God. He gives them the delights of his love back. Psalm chapter 37, Psalm 37, an often quoted psalm, a favorite of mine. Psalm 37 in verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. There it is. You delight in God, and what does He give you? The desires that you have in your heart, what 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 you what you long for, what you need at this time, what 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 would just give you the the, the feeling of blessing and love and, and just just joy unspeakable and full of glory that comes if you delight yourself also in the Lord. Verse eleven it says, "But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace." That that peace, that 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 wonderful. Um, that wonderful peace first between you know God and ourselves, but also just the peace that passes all understanding, that comfort that comes from being delight and in the delight of the Lord. Verse 23 says, The steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in all his ways. And this is one of those verses that I like to look at and, and just think about and meditate upon because he delighteth in all his ways. Well, is that talking about the good man or is that talking about the, the Lord here? Is, is the good man delighting in the Lord's way or is the Lord now delighting in the good man's way? Well, it, it, it's both, and you can actually read both from that that scripture from that context that that's because I'm delighting in God I'm, I'm I'm delighting in the way that he has before me I'm delighting in the way that he has chosen for me as I follow his statutes and all the while he's delighting in me and he's giving me his love and we are we are both just reciprocating and and having it just as that river runs by God is just continually sending that our way and we can go on and on Psalm chapter 119 talks about more different ways that the delights of God are available to those that delight in Him. Psalm chapter 119. And this is all about the Word of God, you know. In verse 16, it says, I will delight myself in thy statutes and will not forget thy word. Verse 24, thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Verse 35, make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. 
Verse 47, And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. Verse 70, Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. Verse 77, Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Verse 92, Unless thy law had been my delight, I should have perished in my affliction. 143, Trouble and anguish have taken hold on me, yet thy commandments are my delights. And over in 174, I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. We need to delight in the scriptures. We need to delight in the law of God. It's not just these laws that we have to begrudgingly follow. The reality is, is that the more you follow these laws, the more you delight to know his word and to apply it to your life, the more delights of his love he gives. And I think the songwriter captured it perfect. We can never prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. What altar is he talking about? What are we laying on there? Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We need to delight in the law of God, thereby we would delight in what he has um, planned for us, what he wants us to do, how he wants us to grow, what he wants us to change, where he wants us to be strengthened. And we need to have, to have that full delight, we need to lay something on the altar, the hymn writer here is saying. Verse, or chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're presenting ourselves. We're the sacrifice, a living one. And that's what's acceptable. That's what's reasonable. That's what God really, it, it's expected. He saved us. He, he gave us of his word, the promise that he would have us born again through faith in him. And all we have to do in return is just give ourselves to him. It's our choice to do because Paul is here uh, beseeching them. Brethren, I'm beseeching you. The best thing that you could do is delight in the law of God. Delight in his word. You could have the mercies of God if you would just simply present your bodies. Give yourself wholly unto him. Acceptable. Serve him. Don't be conformed with what the world is saying, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. How do you do that? You get more of that word in you. You delight more in the law of God. You meditate more upon the, the, the scriptures and upon God's leading and upon God's word written in the King James Bible here. When you do that, you are being transformed, and now you are that perfect, pure, holy, acceptable, reasonable sacrifice unto him. You can just simply lay it down, and God will accept it. God will be pleased with that. And that comes through our trust and our obedience in him. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Verse 5, it says, Then in fellowship sweet... The, the conclusion of this, in fellowship sweet. When does that come? Well, that comes when we, we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. When we, when we don't let the dark shadows and, and the struggles and the, and the temptations and, and the, the, the fears get in our way, but we rather just trust him and follow him. When we let him bear our burdens and we, 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 we stop letting them, them weigh us down, when we have a mind that's focused on the fact that eternity is so much greater than what we have here and also the rich blessings that he gives us here for free are so much more than the little bit of labor that we do in his service we we never will know what he has for us until we simply give ourselves fully unto him and allow him to be our delight and allow his delights to come upon us then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or will walk by his side in the way what he says we will do where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey Finally, you are at the point where you've had all of these things come into your life. You're, 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 you're renewed. You're, you're offered. You're, you're willing. You're, you're obeying. You're believing. You're trusting in God. And he now is able to just, and you are able to, have that sweet, sweet fellowship with him. You can go to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. 
finish up there. And it is glory to walk with God. It is glory to have Him lead you. It's wonderful to have Him take you step by step by step as the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in His way. That's, that's a wonderful blessing that we have as Christians is that we can walk with the Lord, talk with the Lord, take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe, right? We can have God with us each and every day as we go, but it's also oh so sweet to fellowship and to sit at His feet as even Mary and Martha experienced right here. Luke chapter 10 and verse 38, it says, Now it came to pass as they went, they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So here Martha receives Jesus into her own house, and she has a sister there who's also in, in that house. She's at Jesus' feet here, hearing his word. And Martha, the hostess here, it says in verse 40, but Martha was cumbered about much with much serving, cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. So here's like the dichotomy in that verse that we found in Trust and Obey where it says in Fellowship Suite, we'll sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. And, and Martha here was working and laboring and, and toiling. The, the Bible says that, that she was cumbered about much serving, serving God, walking with God, obeying God, pleasing God, offering herself as that servant unto him. And yet she becomes envious of the sister that's simply sitting at his feet and says, Lord, he, she, she's doing nothing. She's just sitting here and I'm doing all this work and I'm, and I'm serving you. Will you just leave me to serve alone? Will you not tell her to get involved and get active and get going? Verse 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. As wonderful it is to walk with God, and to serve with God, and to work for God, and to do all of these things, Jesus here quickly reproves Martha in all her busyness, and simply says, hey, there is one thing that is needful. There is one thing that is important. There is one thing that is elevated above it all. I, I appreciate the work you're doing for me. I appreciate the toil that you're doing for me. I appreciate all that you're doing. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that. What did she choose? Back in verse 39, it says, She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word, which shall not be taken away from her. This is that good part. This is the good thing that you can have. And when you have sweet, sweet fellowship with our Savior, you can sit at his feet. Yeah, you can walk by his side in the way. You can do the works. You can, you can labor with him. But what a joy it is when you can just be with him and hear his word. It's a wonderful blessing that comes to those that trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey we need not fear, and that's what it says, never fear, only trust and obey. What he says we will do, where he says we will go, and when, when Martha was busy running about doing all sorts of things, I think she was missing out on the where he says, where he sends, what he says. The, 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 the explanation, the, the command, the charge that comes in the scriptures, when God really wants you to move and to do things, it's missed if we're always cumbered about in, in the busyness of life and we're always, we're always just serving and serving and serving and serving. I think this is something that we can all get, get in trouble with. We, we serve and soul win and labor and toil and we're working and working and working and traveling and doing all this ministry and all this work and all these labors and we become Martha and we miss out on what is needful. And that's to just sit at the feet of Jesus and wait for him to say something. And then what he says, we will do. Where he says, we will go. And we can do that without fear. Because then we have the clear scriptures that say, hey, by faith, do this. You can do this by faith. And this is the problem, again, that we always get into is we become Marthas. We become busy, careful, troubled about many things. 
And we miss out on just that faith walk, just that trust in God and just actually following his lead. How, how often in my life have I gotten busy in things of God, serving God and missed out probably um, and, and knowingly after, you know, hindsight 2020 on God's will and God's desire for me because I was just too busy about things. If I don't hear the word, I don't have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So that's why Jesus is pointing out to Martha that, hey, there's the one thing that is needful. What's the one thing that is needful? When we go to the door, what do we say is the one thing that is needful? Belief, faith, trust. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, right? So Martha's missing out on the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's the good part. That's what she's missing when she's busy all the time. And yet, Christ here gives her grace and says, hey, one thing's needful. I think after that, Martha sat down <laughs> at Jesus' feet. There's, there's enough serving going on. Just sit down here. Hear my word. Walk by faith. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. How, how do we obey what we've never heard? How do, we, how do we trust in what's never been promised? That's why we need, to, we need to bring these scriptures constantly to our memories because I can guarantee that by the time I read this Bible front to back, in a year or half a year, whatever it takes me. By the time I read these Bibles front to back, I'll get back here and, and I forget something that was promised up here. That's, that's just my, my human frailty. And so when I go back again, oh, those promises are all new again. Well, if, if, we, if we don't remember the promises, we can't trust in the word that was given. If, if we don't remember the commands, we can't obey the word that was given. And so therefore that good part is to, in fellowship sweet, sit at his feet and then walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he says we will go, without fear. And the only way you can have fear out is to have perfect love. That's what casts out all fear. And your perfect love comes from, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's our walk in a nutshell. And this is why this is a hymn that's just constantly, always, just rhyming through my head, especially in times when I'm just... I feel like a Martha. I feel like I'm just busy. I feel like I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm grinding my gears and not really getting anywhere. It's because I'm not taking the time to just trust and obey. And trust and obey. Isn't it such a simple cadence? Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. As opposed to, uh, you know, think, conceive, plan, plot, maybe ask God, then trust that he'll stamp my plans, then do... <laughs> You know what I mean? There's so much convoluted complication and, and problems that come when men try to make their own way of things. When God, I believe, and this hymn writer I think captured it, just wants us to be on that game plan of trust, obey, trust, obey. Hear the word, trust the word, obey what it says. Obey what he wants you to do and trust him to carry you through it. You just keep on this reciprocal motion and this walk with God and you will be blessed in it without fear, without fretting, without struggle if we would just trust and obey our God.